Okay guys, this is lecture 11, living in water, diving and buoyancy, or black muscle, fat sharks and gassy fish. These are the learning objectives, uh, sorry, the learning outcomes. So we want to look at how, what the, uh, explain what the major physiological problems are for diving organisms and how they overcome them. So we're talking about the bends, oxygen toxicity, gas narcosis, oxygen supply, and the effects of pressure. And then we want to outline, we're going to, um, you should be able to by the end of the lecture outline how organisms ensure they are buoyant through reduction in heavy substances, including ions and hypotonicity, using fats and oils, gas floats and swim bladders. So these are the learning objectives, so what we're going to look at in this lecture. How, an, how air breathing diving organisms can dive to depth for long periods of time, how organisms can achieve neutral buoyancy, and how uh, bony fish can fill their swim bladders with gases in excess of 100 atmospheres. And a couple of key words, root effect, you should be familiar for that when we looked at circulation. Um, REIT, which is to do with swim bladders, that the bends, which is to do with diving to, uh, di di the effects of diving at depth, myoglobin and hypotonicity. All right, these are the relevant sections in the textbooks. As a diving marine organism, there are basically um, five problems that you face which are a result of pressure or if you breathe gas under pressure. So we've got the bends which results from increased pressure, oxygen toxicity which results from increased pressure, gas narcosis which results from increased pressure, uh, the effects of pressure which obviously comes from the effects of increased pressure and the only one that's not due to pressure is oxygen supply. So if you look at the composition of air, uh, we can basically say it's 21% oxygen and 79% argon. Yes, it's almost 21% oxygen. There's a fractional amount of carbon dioxide, so about 400 parts per thousand. Argon's, uh, sorry, nitrogen's only 78% and argon's almost 1%. So really what we can break it down into, because argon and nitrogen are both inert under normal conditions, is we can say 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. Now going back to uh, the, the very first, and you might remember from a former lecture that for every 10 metres of water depth we dive down to, we increase the pressure surrounding us by one atmosphere, so at, or one bar. So at the surface, at sea level, we say the, pre the, the total pressure of air around us is one atmosphere. If I dive to 10 metres, it becomes two atmospheres. If I dive to th 20 metres, it becomes three atmospheres. If I dive to uh, 30 metres, it becomes four atmospheres, and so on and so on. So remember I say knock off zero and add one, so if I dive to 10 metres, I knock off zero, that leaves me with one, and if I add one, I, one plus one is two, so that means the pressure there is two atmospheres. All right, so what I want you to do is I want you to um, pause the recording, I want you to look at these numbers, and I want you to calculate what you think the um, partial pressure of oxygen is at each of these and then listen to what I've said, what I'll say. I'll give you the answers and how I've worked it out in a minute. But I want you to try it out for yourself. If you get them all right, move on to the next slide. If you don't, listen to what I do and then move on to the next slide. And for this, remember, you'll need to know Dalton's law, where the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures. And remember, uh, we say that uh, air is a 21% mix of oxygen to 79% nitrogen. So pause now and try and work these out. Okay, so let's work out what the partial pressure of oxygen is at 10 metres. So what's the total pressure of the mixture of gases to start with? So at sea level it's uh, one atmosphere. If I dive 10 metres it increases by one atmosphere. So the total pressure at 10 metres water depth is two atmospheres. And now I've got a 21% mix of nitrogen to 79%, uh, 21% mix of oxygen to 79% nitrogen. Okay, so that means uh, at the surface, okay, the partial pressure of oxygen, where the pressure is one atmosphere, is 0.21. If I dive to 10 meters, I've doubled the total pressure to two atmospheres, so it's going to be 0.21 times two, which gives me the partial pressure of oxygen of 0.42. All right, what I want you to do is work your way through these and make sure that you can work them out and that you're happy that you can calculate what the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be for each of the depths. So because we're talking about um, pressure and because we're talking about oxygen, let's look at one of the, the first thing we're going to look at as a, as a problem resulting from diving um, breathing pressurized gas is oxygen toxicity. So what I want you to do first of all is I want you to play the little flash which is the, uh, the little uh, video which is ox uh, cigar burning in pure oxygen. And remember from um, when you did chemistry at school, 
how did you test for oxygen? And the test for oxygen was you put, put a glowing splint into a test tube, and if the splint relit, then that you knew there was oxygen there. So oxygen is toxic, okay? And oxygen becomes toxic at a depth of, of 1.6 atmospheres, and that's a depth between, um, basically between uh, 70 and 80 meters. Um, now, why is oxygen toxic? Well, if you think about it, Oxygen is an oxidizer, okay? Oxidizer, um, it's very reactive. And in fact, when you go to hospital and you see people breathing what we think is pure oxygen, it's not pure oxygen. It's actually a 40% oxygen, 60% nitrogen mix. And if we did breathe pure oxygen at the surface, um, after about 48 hours, we'd actually start to um, develop respiratory problems because the oxygen is basically attacking our lung surface. So if you look at uh, the images here, what you can see is you can see the effect of uh, uh, pure oxygen on uh, mouse lung epithelia over a period of time and basically what you can see is you can see the cell walls breaking down and the space is getting bigger which means that you effectively get less effective at being able to take up oxygen because the oxygen is destroying your lung epithelia. So if I'm diving okay, and I'm um, breathing compressed gas which is effectively what I'm doing because when I breathe from the uh, diving cylinder on my back the first and second stage drop the pressure so that I'm breathing air coming into my lungs at the pressure of the water surrounding me outside otherwise I wouldn't be able to breathe so that means that at uh, 60 meters I'm actually breathing air which has a pressure of seven atmospheres okay remember uh, knock off zero add one okay so what's the partial pressure of oxygen at uh, 60 meters well that's going to be seven times 0.21 which is going to be give me a concentrate uh, a pressure of oxygen of uh, 1.47 all right so at 60 meters I've got an oxygen I've got an oxygen concentration of a uh, partial pressure of oxygen at 1.47 and if I actually um, start to breathe oxygen above uh, 1.6 uh, with a partial pressure of above 1.6 atmospheres it's going to actually cause me to begin to pass out fit and these are things I don't obviously want to do underwater because I've got a regulator in my mouth and if I pass out and start to fit, that regulator is going to come out of my mouth and then I'm going to start to breathe water. So if I want to deal, deal, dive deeper than 60 metres, so at 60 metres the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be uh, 7 times uh, 0.21, okay, which is going to be 1.47, how am I going to deal with the effect of oxygen toxicity? So pause the slide and think about okay at 60 I can't really go beyond 60 meters with a 21 percent 79 percent uh, air mix what can I do to be able to dive deeper than that um, and not suffer from oxygen toxicity so pause now and have a think all right you've paused and the answer is quite obvious so what I do is I'll take a cylinder down to me to that depth which has a lower concentration of oxygen in. And this is what we see. We see uh, divers when they start to dive deep. So the record for diving on compressed air at the moment is around 230 metres. And what they do is they take a series of bottles down them with different gas mixes. We normally call it trimix, and it's a mixture of helium, nitrogen and oxygen. So uh, down to about 50 metres, I'll just dive down on 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen. I get to 50 metres, I've got my new bottle in, and that will have 10% oxygen, 60% uh, nitrogen in it, and 10% helium. That will take me down to, say, 100 metres. I'll then have another bottle, which is now 5% oxygen, 60% nitrogen, and 15% uh, helium, and so on and so on. So what I do is I keep lowering the oxygen concentration, and I'll actually keep, I'll start to remove the nitrogen as well as I get deeper and deeper to ensure that I never breathe, I'm never going to be at a depth where I'm going to uh, be breathing oxygen and at a partial pressure of greater than 1.6 atmospheres. Okay, you may remember from the very, uh, very first lecture we talked about Henry's law and where we said that the solubility of a gas is proportional to its partial pressure. So, what are the implications of this? This means that as I dive, as the as I breathe in gas at pressure, because the gas has to be supplied to me of the pressure of the water surrounding me, that means I'm going to have uh, more and more gas dissolving in my blood. Okay, because the solubility of the gas increases because the total pressure, because the pressure is increased. So here we're going to be talking about gas narcosis. Okay, so 
nitrogen we normally think is totally inert, it's an inert gas, it's non-reactive. However, if we start to um, breathe nitrogen on pressure, what happens is we start to form nitrous oxide in our blood, and nitrous oxide is also known as laughing gas, or um, it's what used to be used at the dentist as an anaesthetic um, if they were going to extract a tooth or, do some, or put, a, put a filling in or something like that. Now at the surface this is not a problem, but however when you're diving down, and you, most people start to get knocked around 40 metres diving depth, so it's well within normal diving depth, um, it's like being drunk. And this is a bit of a bad idea because what happens is if you're drunk, your reaction times are slower, you're more likely to mistake, make a mistake, you're more likely to be stupid. So if you're going to dive deep, being knocked is going to be a real, real problem. So what would be the easiest way to overcome being knocked? Um, and then what you can do is you can watch the little video and what they do is to let you know what it's like being knocked. Um, they have hyperbaric chambers, which is just the basically big steel cylinder at the surface. They can put you in it and then they pump up the air pressure in there to simulate as if you're diving down, except you're not under any water. And um, you get knocked really quickly and you think everything's hilarious and you try and add up 2 plus 2 and you end up with the answer of 7. The other problem um, with uh, the increased solubility of gas as pressure increases is um, you can get something called uh, the bends or getting bent and this is a diver's worst nightmare. Right, so as you dive, what you're basically doing as you increase the pressure is you're putting more gas into your bloodstream and into your body, into your tissue. Now, if you remain at that depth, this is fine, but what's going to happen to that gas in your tissue if you suddenly ascend to the surface without giving it a chance to off gas? Well, instead of being nice gas that's dissolved in your blood, it becomes horrible gas that makes little uh, bubbles in your blood and your body. Bubbles in your blood, bubbles in your body are a bad idea because what they're going to lead, lead to is they're going to... Um, lead to an embolism and uh, the stroke and usually death. death. Now, um, what can we do to overcome this? So what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll either dive so our tissues never become saturated enough so that when we do, did do a rapid ascent to the surface the bubbles wouldn't come out, or if our tissues do become oversaturated we'll do stops as we come up to the surface to allow time for our, um, the gas in our the dissolved gas in the blood to re-equilibrate so that when we do come to the surface we're not going to be bent. Alright, so two slides ago I said, well, I had a lot of marine mammals, how can they avoid getting bent? Uh, how, sorry, how can they avoid getting knocked? And if we look at all marine animals, um, they don't suffer the bends, they don't suffer oxygen toxicity and they don't suffer being knocked. And we have Weddell seals diving to greater than 16, 600 metres and staying down for over an hour. Um, Sperm whales can dive to greater than 2,000 metres, and elephant seals can dive down to 1,500 metres. And so these are huge depths, well beyond the diving capacity of humans, and they don't suffer from the bends, oxygen toxicity, or gas narcosis. So how? How are these animals special? If we do any of that, we certainly get um, suffer from all of these, and we'd um, die. But they don't. Well, there are three possible answers. Um, for the bends, they could be tolerant to bubble formation. Okay, so um, what they do is bubbles do form in the blood, but they're not on their tissue, but they're not bothered by it. Uh, they could have mechanisms to avoid bubble formation and gas toxicity, even though their uh, bodies are super saturated, so they're just really special. Or, and if we use the rule of parsonomy, the most likely explanation, their blood or tissue doesn't become super saturated. And that's the answer, but I want you to think about why. Why is that the answer? And why is that the answer? Well, it's obvious they're not breathing gas under pressure. So all diving mammals, what they do is at the, they have to come up to the surface to um, breathe oxygen because they've got lungs just like us. They don't have gills, remember? They're mammals. Okay. So the uh, total pressure of the gas in their lungs will be one atmosphere, and then when they dive down, unless their lungs compress massively, which they're not going to do because their rib cages would break, 
Okay, the total pressure of gas in their lungs and in their body is always going to be at one atmosphere. So they're not going to suffer any problems of increased um, of problems of increased gas pr pressure. All right, humans suffer from this because when we dive, we die. When we do dive, we do we are breathing gas under pressure. These organisms just have the gas in their lungs that they've taken at the surface. All right, marine mammals because they've got um, their their gas. Uh, in their blood is only ever going to be at one atmosphere okay um, they're not going to get bent they're not going to suffer from oxygen toxicity they're not going to get knocked but they are going to suffer from a lack of oxygen supply so if you try and hold your breath I reckon even if you're really good you could only probably hold it for a maximum of two minutes if you um, free if you do a lot of spear fishing you might be able to go to four minutes but you know we've got seals going down for more than 60 minutes so where do they get their oxygen from? How can they how can they stay down for 60 minutes um, without having a tank of air strapped to their back? Right, and it's um, not because the animals are any fitter. If we look at their metabolic rate, uh, a seal's metabolic rate is equivalent to ours. It's weight for weight um, at the surface. So how are these animals managing to dive so deep and for so long when we can maximally hold our breath for four minutes? Well, there's three ways we could increase our oxygen capacity, and you could think about this. Um, it's a bit like us moving up to um, altitude for some of them. So we could increase our amount of oxygen storage, which means we're going to increase the amount of um, respiratory pigments we have and the fitness of our cardiovascular system. We can use anaerobic processes, and we can possibly reduce our metabolism so we go into some sort of torpid state. Now. Lungs in marine mammals are smaller, okay, than actual terrestrial their terrestrial counterparts, and that'll be to do with buoyancy. And also, the hemoglobin content of blood is limited by blood viscosity. So basically, if we have too much red blood cells in our blood, our blood becomes too viscous; it's too hard to pump round. So there are limits. So what organisms are going to have to do is use a mixture of these strategies to be able to stay down um, for a long time. All right. So let's look at respiratory pigments, okay? And if you look here. Uh, what you can see is we can see where oxygen storage is occurring in these organisms and what the pigments are uh, responsible for. And you can see in humans, okay, um, we've about 50% of our oxygen is, support, is uh, stored is um, in our lungs, okay, and most of that oxygen is actually uh, dissolved, is uh, held in our blood with our hemoglobin, and there's a little bit in myoglobin and a little bit. Um, dissolved in body fluids. However, if we start looking at diving marine mammals, we can see that there's, uh, they've increased the amount of respiratory pigment in their blood because uh, the amount of oxygen stored in their blood is above, well above 50% that we see in humans. Okay, But we can see there's a massive jump in the myoglobin as well. So they're, significant, they're substantially increasing the amount of respiratory pigments that they have in their body to increase their oxygen carrying and holding capacity. And that black meat you can see there, that, that lady cutting up, is uh, seal meat, okay? And we've got a steak next to it to compare it. And the reason that that black meat is so black is because of its enormous myoglobin content, which makes the meat really, really dark. Okay, so the increase in respiratory pigments in marine mammals increases the storage capacity, but it's actually only double that of terrestrial organisms. So that means, okay, the increase in myoglobin and hemoglobin means that seals can now dive for eight minutes compared to four minutes, but how the hell do they manage to stay down for more than 60 minutes? All right, I've got a limited oxygen supply. I want to stay down for longer. What am I going to do? I'm going to reduce my oxygen consumption. So when even at the surface, metabolism is the same for marine mammals um, on a size-for-size -size basis as terrestrial organisms. However, when they dive, what they do is they basically reduce blood flow to their extremities. So they keep their, what they're doing is they're maximizing the amount of oxygen in their core. And effectively what they're doing is going into a, a, a state of uh, extraneous torpor. Right? And um, blood flow to the brain is unchanged, obviously, because we don't want to, uh, the brain's the most important. But if we look at blood flow to the retina, it drops by two thirds, and it drops by five sixths to the heart. Now, I'm not going to give you the answer, but I want you to think about, well, why aren't they bothered about seeing when they're diving at depth? Okay, so they increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. They reduce their metabolic rate, um, thereby increasing the time they can spend down. And finally, what they do is um, they um, 
build up a substantial oxygen debt so they switch into anaero anaerobic respiration as they begin to run out of uh, oxygen and their anaerobic respiration capacity is uh, greater than that of uh, normal terrestrial mammals. Okay, one last thing that organism, marine organisms face um, living at depth, and that's the effect of pressure. And this is obviously isn't going to apply to marine mammals because they spend most of the time near the surface, but it does apply to deep sea organisms, and that is that pressure affects protein structure. So pressure affects protein structure, so much so that Bridgman in 1914 demonstrated that you could cook an egg just by increasing uh, the atmospheric pressure, so, or in, by increasing the pressure surrounding it. And that's because uh, proteins, are their shape is defined or held together by weak bonds, and if we increase the pressure, we break those bonds, okay? We're basically um, watery bags of protein, okay? And that's what all living organisms are. So this means that organisms that do live at immense pressures have to, evolve, have to have evolved special proteins that can deal with the effects of extreme pressure. All right, so let's look at buoyancy. So, unless you're lighter than water or neutrally buoyant, you're going to have to expend some energy to stay in the same vertical position, okay? Because you're going to sink, and unless you want to be living on the bottom, you're going to have problems. Now, if you're a small microscopic organism, this isn't um, so much of a problem, because remember, um, because of their Reynolds number, so they have a very uh, high Reynolds number. This means that it's, uh, they're effectively living in a, an environment that feels like treacle. So how would you stop yourself sinking in sinking sand or sinking in golden syrup if someone put you in a giant vat of golden syrup? Well, you just spread yourself out, okay? You maximize your surface area, and that would mean that you wouldn't sink. And that's what the, the microscopic organisms do in water, is they'll develop spicules and spines which increase their surface area and basically hold them in a set position. However, for large organisms, surface extensions don't work, okay, so if you think about us in fresh water, okay, we put our, um, put our arms out, we'll just sink, especially if we breathe out. Okay, so there are five main ways in which an organism can um, reduce its density or increase its buoyancy. So we could reduce the amount of hairy substances that are, uh, that are in them, so get rid of shells, carapaces, bones. We could remove heavy ions and replace them with lighter ions, so I get rid of magnesium and sulfate and replace it, replace it with sodium chloride, hydrogen. I can remove ions without replacement, so I become a hypotonic to my environment. So rather than being isoosmotic or, hyper, or hypertonic, I actually become hypoosmotic. I can increase the amount of substances that are lighter than water in me, so I can have oils and fats, and or I can use gas floats. So, for example, we use our lungs as gas floats to remain buoyant in water. Okay, so reducing the amount of heavy substances in you. So, um, this is a simple one. We see it very commonly in mollusks. So, mollusks normally have a hard cal uh, calcium carbonate-based shell, okay? So, if we look at squids, which are mollusks, okay? Um, the ink pens in them are made of chitin rather than calcium carbonate. Uh, we look at um, nudibranchs, which are a subclass of gastropoda, okay, so they're sea slugs, and most of them have lost their shells completely or it's become very much reduced. So by losing um, heavy particle, but by losing heavy components of your body, so bones or shells, you can increase your buoyancy. You could replace or remove heavy ions, okay? So substitute, remove heavy ions like sulfates and substitute them with something lighter. And this is typically what we see in a lot of algal species. We also see it in animals and whale, whereas we have cranky squids, which are known as ammoniacal squids, which are what sperm whales eat and have the giant fights with. And what they do is they basically um, increase the amount of uh, ammonia in their body. Ammonia is lighter than water and that gives them buoyancy. And you could remove ions without replacement, so you increase your hypotonicity, or hy uh, hypo um, you become hypoosmotic to your external environment. And remember, I said in the last lecture we talked about this theory that teleostomy should evolve in freshwater and move back into the sea, and I said, no, no this is all rubbish. Teleostomy evolved in the marine environment and then moved into freshwater. But for some reason there was a big uh, advantage, a uh, big selection pressure to becoming um, hypoosmotic to environment rather than being isoosmotic or hyperosmotic and that's because this uh, the reduction in the osmotic potential of the in 
of the, the reduction in the osmotic potential of the internal environment of tea last fish um, will have increased their buoyancy in the freshwater environment. And if you think about it, just about all fish we find in freshwater are teleost fish. Okay, so another thing we can do is we can increase the amount of substances that are lighter than water in us, which we sort of already see in the ammoniacal squids with ammonia. But diatoms, um, can, which are microscopic algae, contain lots of oil. Um, the foam that you normally see at the, at the seaside sometimes after a storm is basically uh, the froth that's made from diatoms breaking up and their oil being released and they're mixed with the water. So it's an emulsion. And this picture, that's a person in a mountain of froth, and this was taken on um, the um, coast in northern New South Wales. It would have been fantastic to see it. If we look at sharks, okay, 15% um, of the body weight of a, of a shark is liver, okay, and 75% of that liver is an oil called squalene, all right? In our bodies, only 5%, okay, of our body weight is our liver. All right, and finally we come on to gas floats, and we have two types of gas float. We have soft-walled gas floats, so these are basically like balloons, and we have rigid-walled gas floats, which are a bit like polystyrene floats. Now, the advantage of rigid-walled gas floats is that their buoyancy is unaffected by changes in depth. So if you think about it, if we have a balloon, I've got a balloon at the surface, so I take it down to 10 metres, the pressure is doubled, the balloon size will have halved, okay? So that means that if I've got a soft-walled gas float, um, as I change depth, that will affect the buoyancy of me. For a hard float, there's no effect, uh, changing depth won't have an effect on buoyancy. But the problem is, with a hard float, as we increase the depth, there's a gr more and greater and greater likelihood of that hard float being crushed. With a soft float, it'll just get smaller. So a classic example of a hard float is the cuttlefish cuttlebone. Um, those of you who have birds won't be familiar with cuttlebones. If they put them in the budgie cages, then the buddies pack budgies pack it away to increase the amount of calcium in their diet. Um, you see these washed up at the sea all the time and basically it's just a fancy um, calcium carbonate chitin reinforced chamber system okay and it's filled with nitrogen and what it, it does that by it's fluid filled and it, what it does using osmo by increasing osmotic potential the fluid's drawn out and the nitrogen is left behind and the cuttle bone um, has, um, can withstand an external pressure down to about 24 atmospheres. Now this means that cuttlefish are never are uh, basically restricted to the top 200 meters of the ocean, which is exactly what we see. If they try and dive deeper than that, the cuttle bone actually gets crushed and they lose their buoyancy. Now these are some examples of some soft walled floats. So we have uh, blue bottles, okay? We have uh, and we have uh, colonial sy siphonophore, and we have uh, Janthia janthia which is the purple snail that you see sometimes washed up in the shores around here. Now blue bottles you're all familiar with, and they've got that gas float at the so top, and it's actually interestingly filled with carbon monoxide, which is bizarre because carbon monoxide is so reactive. Um, but the reason it's filled with carbon monoxide is because it's, it's a breakdown product of the amino acid serine, and we see the same carbon monoxide in, uh, the siphon in siphonophores. Now, Janthia Janthia uses a different strategy. What it does is it produces mucus bubbles and it aerates the mucus bubbles. So it basically generates a mucus bubble raft. So just like when you were a little kid and you had a snotty mouth or a cold and you blew snotty bubbles, that's exactly what this um, snail is doing. And if we think about the ultimate soft-walled float, okay, with, we're going to think about teleost fish or bony fish swim bladders, okay? And if we look at bony fish swim bladders, we see that um, they account for 5% of the body volume in seawater and 7% in freshwater, and you're going to be able to tell me why. Now, we get two types of uh, swim bladder, or teleost fish we can divide into, with swim bladders, we can divide into two types. So we have physostomas and physoclistus. Physostome means that they're swim bladders um, connected to their uh, mouth. So that means that when they do dive uh, up or down, if there's gas expansion, the, uh, the gas within their swim bladder can escape. So this means that fish that do vertical migration will be physostomus. However, deep water fish, these are fish that remain in the deep ocean all the time, so don't do any vertical migration, tend to be physoclistic, which means that their swim bladders are completely closed. So if I go fishing and I cap capture deep water fish and I bring them up to the surface, their swim bladders are going to pop out their mouth, their eyes are going to bulge out, all the rest. Whereas if I've got a physostomus fish, um, they would just release the gas as I brought it up in my net to the surface. So these are the two types of swim bladders I've mentioned. 
Okay, from electron nitrogenous excretion, you may remember that the um, swim blood of the fish is lined with uh, little crystals of platelets of guanine, rendering them gas impermeable. Okay, and in the majority of fish, the actual gas that's contained in the swim bladder tends to be oxygen, although argon is sometimes used as well. Now, we get fish with swim bladders below, well below 4,000 meters, so that means the gas in their swim bladder must be greater, have a pressure greater than 400 atmospheres. And a normal diving tank, that steel or aluminium cylinder you structure your bank, has a pressure in it of 200 atmospheres. So the pressure in, these, in the swim bladder of these fish is twice the pressure we find in a diving tank. And if I had a diving tank and I have a concrete wall and I knock, I knock the head of the valve off the diving tank, that diving tank would punch a hole straight through the concrete wall without even thinking about it. So enormous pressure. So how do these organisms generate such an enormous pressure Okay, in their swim bladder. Well, how do we in physiology generate, uh, uh, manage to shunt stuff from what from one place to another and generate enormous gradients? Well, the answer is we use a countercurrent multiplier, just as we see in vertebrate kidneys. Okay, so what we've got is we've got a swim bladder and. Um, the, we've got blood flow or the reek that goes past our swim bladder okay and we've got all these capillaries and they're surrounded by the gas gland now the gas gland produces lactic acid so if I acidify blood what happens to its oxygen carrying capacity oxygen affinity it decreases okay so as the blood passes the glass gland the gas gland acidifies the blood and that causes it to off gas oxygen okay which is going to cause the oxygen to diffuse across to the other side now if the pressure of gas in the blood is greater than the pressure in the swim bladder, that gas is going to move from the blood into the swim bladder. In addition, what we see is, um, as well as acidifying the blood through lactic acid, um, the reeds um, and the gas gland will actually start to increase the, ion, the concentration of ionic solutes, so salts in the blood, again causing a decrease in oxygen affinity, increasing the amount of oxygen in the blood. If the oxygen in the blood, uh, free oxygen in the blood is greater than the oxygen, uh, the amount of oxygen in the swim bladder, that gas is shunted across the swim bladder. Okay, I want you to uh, move your way through these um, slides just to make sure you understand how the countercurrent multiplier works in fish swim bladders and that's the end of this lecture.